apply for one of these Purdue or Bad with Acronyms Center for Global Food Security faculty seed grants as a as a pathway to go after some of the bigger foundation money like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who have been funding the first two phases of the Next Gen Cassava Project. <laughs> Talk really fast. Okay, so quickly to recap, um, the work that I've shown today really falls in the sphere of analytics when we're thinking about this digital framework. And in the future, I hope that my work will be able to find the connections with these other, other spheres. So with the engineers that are working to build the sensors to collect the data, and to try to figure out the ways um, in which we can link phenomic information out to these model parameters, as well as with the computer scientists who are trying to increase the accessibility and network connectivity uh, so that the, the models that underlie the tools that we build can hopefully reach a broader audience. Um, so, so I've talked a lot about models and, and how they can be really useful tools, but I want to pose this question to you guys, and it's really something to think about is what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? How do we interact with this framework? in agricultural research, and I guess this is what position is really about as well. And for me, I guess my answer, sort of, is that um, producing food really hasn't changed a whole lot since the Neolithic Revolution, and maybe you may argue against that, but um, for me, I think that you know farmers, they still need good seed that's adapted to their local <coughs> environments, and they still need you know, the management techniques to care for their crops. And so, really, my hat's off to the breeders and the agronomists out there in the world, and also many here in this room, because you are at the front lines of, of fighting global hunger. And I think that, as an agricultural community right now, we, we must be thoughtful about the ways that we develop and deploy digital innovation, and to ensure that we use it to narrow and not widen the gaps between agriculture and the developing world and the developed world and also to use it to, um, to become better stewards of our environment. And so, and so I leave you today with those thoughts, and um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. receive your first award and uh, if Dr. Long Taco gave you one million dollars, <laughs> what, what would be your first project to do? So before I receive a first grant? Yes. Like in case I had just come upon one million dollars? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the hall a lot of the time. We have it in the hall. Just find it in the hallway. Yeah. Um, I think that I would go after uh, something that is most likely to be successful, I think, or, or push the, because I don't want to go too far out and be super risky, right? Because you want this funding to sort of provide the impetus for more people to give me more money. So I think that first project that I talked about, which is really trying to find the connections between hybrid phenotyping, conventional phenotyping, biotyping, um, to link them with process-based modeling for genetic mapping is, is the project that I would try to put the money towards. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, people are, we are trying to do that, I guess. All of us are trying to make those connections. And I think that it takes, it takes the dedicated effort on the part of the modeler to be very open to, to modifying that architecture. Because we can't take something really off the shelf, I think, and expect it to work because um, we need to be very considerate of the genetic relevance, relevance of the parameters for these models. We need to think about right. Are they feasible to collect? Are they? Are they? Are we going to make the connections with the the data that are coming off of the phenomics sensors? And are they are they heritable? Do they really capture the genetic variability in our in our germ plasm? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Actually, I asked you this question because when I was on there, I mean, I was asked this question. <laughs> 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 I'm sure. So you come from a, actually a very interesting background. You have uh, genetics and physiology and uh, you know, genome-wide association and plant breeding experience and how you've been in a very interesting lab. So as you think about crop modeling, uh, 
uh, what do you think is the biggest efficiency or deficiencies in the crop models that we currently have? Yeah. And so where do you see yourself filling in those gaps? So for me, because I came from a plant breeding and genetics field, um, for me the biggest sort of gap is trying to propagate this uncertainty. Um, because without being able to do that, it's very difficult to make comparisons downstream. Because if we're wanting to apply this across populations, we need to weigh, uh, we need a metric, we need a way to be able to compare them. And in real life, in the real world, the physical world, there are, things are uncertain. There is a distribution. It's not one value, right? So these deterministic simulations, they're very, very good at trying to get at the underlying reasons or the, the processes <coughs> that sort of give rise to the behavior that you see, but they're a pretty poor way to make comparisons. Um, and so if we were able to imagine, like, if you have a simulation and it's just a line, you have a hundred of them, what do you do with that? But if you have a line and there's a distribution around that and you can see that how that plays out, I mean, you can get some very weird behavior too. So you can try to capture um, risk in that way. So for me, that's where I would put my efforts. And, and, and some, and sorry, but and some parameters will be less, more or less uncertain and you may not, the way it propagates out later might not be the way you expect. So, yeah. So you've said a few times that you came from plant breeding and genetics. <laughs> yes. You've said that a few times. So you do this modeling work would you be interested in using some of your results in selection programs yourself, and if so, what crop? So I would be interested in working with breeders to do this if they are interested in working with me. <laughs> um, because I have friends who are breeders and some are more willing to, to try to take on this than others, and it's very practical because they have to be developing varieties. They have you know, they have their stakeholders to, to serve. Um, and here I come in with this newfangled thing, and you know, it has to fit in their, within their priority set too. And so trying to understand like the connections there, I, I don't see myself making selections or um, doing applied plant breeding myself with this model, because I think it's a little far upstream at this point. But I would be very interested in sort of collaborating with the, the plant breeders to maybe some of them will want to try some things out, especially making predictions under novel environments. Diane, I want to go back to your cotton research for your yeah. silico predictions. And following up on Torbert's comment, based on what you ran, what you learned, if you were to advise a plant breeder, uh, what trait would you tell them to, to alter in cotton to improve drought tolerance based on those analyses? Is there something that jumps out? I think something that needs to be more considered, I don't know if it would be the trait to go after to improve, is really we need to evaluate this hydraulic vulnerability relationship because I think it's something that is, it hasn't been widely considered with, with obvious reasons, it's a pain to measure. Um, but we, we are still at the very beginning of, of trying to assess even just how much variation is there in cotton or how much variation is there in any crop. So I think, so for olive and grapevine, there's some studies out there mostly on the physiology, not on the genetic variation side. Uh, and some on sorghum, a couple, a couple of genotypes have been measured for this. But I think there is loads more to learn. And so before I give any advice, I have to kind of assess what is out there. And, and sort of the trade-offs, because um, if you're a physiologist, as you know, it's that every trait has some trade-offs. So we don't want to be selecting something that also impacts yield and fiber quality. But, but if you can't? I know Torbert's not, he's a hard worker, but he's not going to measure hydraulic long No. <laughs> How do you know? Because <laughs> I know you. <laughs> but is there anything, because, you know, breeders do need a, a selection criteria that's fairly discreet and simple. So you're right yeah. there. Is, is there anything that came out of that that you point them to to say, well, let's try this? Like something visual? Well, something simple, you know, it has to be a, you know, breeding, yeah. breeding background. You know, it can't be too convoluted. Right. You gotta apply to a lot of numbers. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that came out? Because I think that's one of the things that really intrigues me is that you know, you're sort of getting there to where you can pin down, you know, you got the line that's purple, the one that's orange, they're different. What 
Can you learn about the plant processes and the traits that can be used for crop improvement and the selection criteria that's mm -hmm. usable? Okay, right. So for me, nothing visual yet because we need to do better on making this model grow for cotton specifically. But um, so, so in terms of, okay, so I have a friend who is a rice breeder in Louisiana State University. And for him, he's trying to implement sort of like how to use genetic markers to speed up his breeding program. Um, and it needs to fit in, you know, with his seasons when he does certain things. Like there's certain parts of the pipeline that can't be changed, but there are certain parts where you can make decisions. So, for instance, using genomic selection, it doesn't change how you would carry out your evaluations, but it may mean that you are first evaluating a larger, a larger pool in the beginning, so you're increasing your selection criteria. So maybe, so if we're able to apply something like process-based modeling, and for hydraulic traits. I mean, the ideal would be not to measure them. The ideal would be to, to put all these high throughput phenomic stuff in them and then you know, parameterize the heck out of your model without the hydraulic parameters and then use it to back out those hydraulic parameters at a genotype level. That's sort of a dream way down the line right now. But if we could do that, then we could give one extra layer of information to a breeder to say this is something you might consider. Don't let it change your breeding program right now, but use it as, well, you know, First, obviously evaluate the yield, the quality of things that are really important, and then maybe this is an extra piece, sort of decorate that decision making. Um, because I am a very practical person, and I, I mean, the breeders are doing what they do, and it's very important, and it's just, it's too risky to sort of make a decision on, on in silico experiments at the moment. <laughs> Can I follow up on Jeff's question yeah. and ask you that, um, and I think this is what you're getting at, is can you add another factor to your model in which you actually vary um, specific genotypes of, the, of your plant to say, okay, if I upregulate this, what would happen to my mm -hmm. model? Because that's way faster than actually making the gene change. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what... Um, that's, what that, that's not in your model right now, is it? What is? Uh, certain... Specific oh. gen genotypes mm -hmm. embedded. So, are you, so are you expression levels, like actual genetic mechanisms embedded in? Well, you don't have to put that in, but you, you would have to know that information mm -hmm. to put it in. So you would know that under certain conditions, certain genes would increase in expression. And so mm -hmm. put that in the model and say, okay, under drought, I know these genes usually yeah. go up. So what, you know, is this a good good one to breed for. Right. Yes, that's also something that we can do possibly in the future. So with these transcriptomics data that are coming off, we're trying to find the links there between the expression data and then the process based information that's already like the architecture that's already there. And that's proving quite tricky right now. Um, the method is not there yet, so we're trying to come up with the method to make the connections. No, you go, I've already asked one, so go ahead. Um, you talked a bit about the global hunger aspect, and uh, uh, so if you look at the kind of spectrum that people are using, at one end they're using this very simplified statistical model, mm -hmm. which are very important. So other than you have this global earth system models, uh, which have a little bit of uh, physiology built into it, mm -hmm. and then you have this very plant scale or field scale detailed crop models, pragmatic kind of thing that they're working. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment a bit on that? I mean, how, how does those span out, or where do you see each one having advantage or using a hybrid kind of system? And perhaps a bit more on if you're really going to grow the scale, uh, the data, what, what strategies would you have in correlating that kind of data? The global scale, so like the Earth system essentially. Sure. So I think that for me personally, I would be interested in sort of working with the, using the data products coming off of those types of models to feed in or to help drive this type of model. If we wanted to ask questions about um, potential outcomes under changing climate scenarios and things like that. For me personally, I like to work at the at a lower scale, at the plant or crop level scale. Um, and this question about coupling models, I think, is a huge, big question mark in the modeling community. Uh, because one, one thing that people may or may not consider is every model has a Assumptions, right? They are just really in, they're imperfect representations of reality. They're very useful, but but there's a set of assumptions that comes with every one. And so, how does the assumptions of one model affect the other? Is something that I think as a modeling community, we need to come together to discuss. Um, and I think there are lots of conferences to do this at. 
So, um, has that answered your question, or did I just? just we can have more conversation. Okay, <laughs> that sounds good. So, you described a number of projects that seem to be going very well, and some of them logically you and your collaborators want to continue. Um, we grow wheat and soybeans, corn, major crops in Indiana. How would you manage work, or would you want to work with those crops, and how would you manage the things you have going that look like it makes sense to keep going with what you would start here? Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I think everyone's research program kind of has a mix of different different projects. Um, and so, so part of this, this NSF proposal that we're putting together is going to try to adopt a model to for use on sorghum, um, which involves like integrating a big synthesis module, which I think can be carried over to maize. Um, I mean, for me, I, I like all crops, so um, I, I would have no problem trying to learn more about the crops that are, I guess, the commodities of Indiana. Um, and also, I guess it also depends on which leaders want to work with me here. <laughs> and, and that would kind of inform um, the direction of my research program as well and where we can find natural connections there. <laughs>